if this were a, quote, routine Sunday, unquote, hesitate to, to apply that term, but I guess it gets the point across, David Brown would be simply walking up and convincing us, rebuking us, or exhorting us, or a combination thereof. <laughs> And uh, those of us who are here at Spring have uh, come to expect uh, tremendous preaching on a routine basis, and we're very grateful to that. David's not with us this morning for a couple of reasons, uh, or not here in, in the pulpit this morning. First of all, because he was not scheduled to, to speak to us as part of the lectureship. And this sermon will be part of that lectureship. But uh, he's been taken down with a malady also. I understand different from the one that some of us have had. So uh, we hope that he is doing well. I understand there was a possibility that he may even go to the emergency room. So let's remember David in our, our prayers too. Now, we have an able substitute. Not only this morning, but sometimes on a routine basis when David's gone otherwise. And our, our speaker this morning is Jeff Lidke. Again, we're pleased to have him because we have been, uh, how do I say, spoiled by a very able substitute. And... Uh, I hope he takes that as a high compliment because if you can substitute for David Brown, you're doing well. Jeff is the uh, father of three daughters, Lorelai, Liliana, and Makaria. He is a 2001 graduate of Spring Bible Institute. <clears throat> Jeff has done local preaching in New Mexico and Texas. He now lives in the Woodlands and is a, a member of the Spring Church of Christ. And we're very pleased to have him here. He's going to speak to us on a very important question this morning, one that I think uh, we have, many of us have, have heard in one form or another, and it says, are pious, unimmersed persons Christians? Jeff, speak to us, please. Thank you, buddy. Let me begin by saying how much I appreciate all the condolences on the death of my grandmother. I appreciate that so much. And the only thing I'll ask is that uh, you keep us in your prayers, and especially my mom. She needs them so much, not just today in the next few days, but in the weeks to come. She'll need that and very much covet your prayers for that. On a different note, I was joking with Dub this morning and said, I've got a great slot, not just because it's Sunday morning, but because uh, Terry speaks before me and after me, so if I speak slowly and end early, I'm just solid gold right there. It's a good spot. <laughs> but I love to hear Terry preach, and I know that most of you he do here too. At least I think you do. <laughs> Privileged to be here this morning, but let me just go on into the lesson. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 and starting in verse 3. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. Verse 4. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell in the stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up, and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Another fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth, some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And that last line is very important in all the parables, and several times Jesus says it throughout his teaching, but it's especially important in this one as the parable of the sower is... Uh, largely one of the keys to all the parables in, in the way that it's expressed and the way that the, uh, the um, interpretation of it is given to the disciples. But I put that out there. Keep it in your mind. Now then, back over to our question. 
are the pious, unimmersed Christians. I think about this and leading up to standing before you and addressing the topic, I started thinking, who is asking this question? And that's a good question to ask in itself. Who's asking the question? You might basically bring it down to two groups that you would address as to who's asking the question. The first would be perhaps young Christians, those who have recently obeyed the gospel. They're still trying to get a grasp on things. And perhaps you might say, well, these are the, this is the group that's asking that question. They don't really understand all the impl implications of the gospel and how it applies. They're, they haven't really thought all those things through. But, you know, let me just point out that in my experience, that's really not the case. I find that most people who are taught properly, who come to the conclusion, I need to be baptized, that those people don't have as big of a problem with this topic. That's just my experience. Now, granted, sometimes they're going through and they're thinking about things as they come into contact with maybe family members, co-workers, friends, neighbors, who are members of denominations. And they may say, well, wait a second, what about this person? And then they click through the process that they went through in, in coming to understand the necessity for themselves to be baptized. They, they go through that process. They say, okay, I understand. I was lost in sin. I understand that Christ uh, told us to be baptized. I was baptized. It was for their mission of sins. I understand that. And I understand that applies to me in the same way it applies to other people in that God is no respecter of persons. And then there's really not much of a problem past that. That is when somebody's taught properly and obeys the gospel. The other group of people are those that know the truth, often have known the truth for years. And when I say they know the truth, they can, they can affirm and maybe pronounce the facts concerning baptism. And they will do so, given the occasion. And yet when it comes down to this question, they're hesitant to give a, a straight yes or no answer. Or worse, they answer incorrectly. We're going to go into what that means as we carry on. But I want you to notice a couple things first. And Bruce did a good job of bringing these out the other night that, as our topics were similar. But the first implication is, if those who have not obeyed the gospel are indeed Christians, then what about our fellowship with those people? Do we properly have what the Bible calls fellowship with those people? That's a good question to ask. And there are implications, as you can obviously see to this. The second one is, and more importantly, if people who have not obeyed the gospel have not complied with the terms of salvation as are spelled out in the New Testament, if they are Christians, then why in the world would we preach that same gospel to them? There really isn't any reason, is there? And if that's the case, then it is true that the gospel does not have the power unto salvation, then it's located somewhere else. Now, those are implications of incorrectly answering this, this question. Now, the simple conclusion, the simple conclusion, I don't want to give a simple conclusion to this question. Let me tell you why. I've already pointed out that the people who are asking this question, when, when it arises in journals, when it comes up in open forums, the people who are posing this question, they already know the answer to the question. So what good would it be to say the things that they themselves would affirm given the opportunity? What, what good would it do? Would it change their mind about the, about the application of those things? You know, I hear a lot, and I say this a lot, but I hear a lot about uh, a clamor for application in preaching. Nobody can do application for anybody else. We can give illustrations. We can teach how applications are made, but nobody can do application for anybody else. And when we're talking about application, we ought to understand that application has two stages. First off, it comes in, in extrapolating the truths from the gospel that do apply to our lives. It's understanding those things. That's, is, that in itself is application. The second stage of application is putting those truths in practice in our lives. There are two stages to application. And if we understand that, then we realize that when somebody will stand up and say that baptism is for their mission of sins and then stand over here and say that somebody who has refused to be baptized for their mission of sins, well, they're Christian, they're saved, and they've they got their ticket punched. That person has not made application. And they might not like it, but they need practical preaching on the subject, if I can say that. Now, the simple conclusion, it's more important to understand the thinking behind it. What is it that causes somebody to assent to the truth, affirm the truth on the subject, and then, and then make a statement which is completely contrary? What thinking is there? Now, I can't possibly 
uh, be exhaustive on this as to what kind of thinking or non-thinking is going on uh, when somebody will affirm the truth and the deny the truth on the exact same subject. I can't cover all of that, but I can understand at least some of what causes somebody to do that. And that there are prior assumptions made that caused them to hesitate in making that application that we discussed on this topic. And let me point out what I think it is. Somebody sees somebody and they say, well, that person is pious. There might be something exhibited in their lives in different degrees and different areas of their lives. Maybe they, they have a, a reputation for honesty. Maybe they're a hard worker. Maybe it is perhaps that they're diligent in reading the Bible. Maybe they put some of those things into practice. Maybe they're very kind. Maybe they're very compassionate. Maybe they're very giving. Any of those things. And you see those things or people will see those things and they say, this is a pious individual. They are so good. They make me feel good when I talk to them, when I'm in association with them. Uh, we can all sympathize with that feeling, certainly. But then they conclude something else. They say, if that's true and they make me feel that good, then God sees it exactly the same way that I do. And right there is where the problem starts. Right there is where the problem starts, is when we stop to say, God sees it exactly the way that I do in that situation. It ought to be that we tailor our thinking to match God's rather than expect God to tailor his thinking to match ours. That's where the problem is. You know, this idea that, well, you know, my neighbor, he's a good guy, lets me borrow his lawnmower, you know, he takes care of things, he, he's helpful, and in the neighborhood, he's a, a diligent guy, an honest guy, and, you know, we, we just get along real swell. You know, that kind of notion that God's going to look on this person and see that value, that, that quality in that person and say, boy, that's a good guy. I'm just going to have to save him. I want you to think about the real implications of that by itself. You realize that destroys the idea of grace? You can't simultaneously hold that God's going to look down at somebody and see something within that person that is, that is above and beyond worthy and say, I'm going to save them for that quality and at the same time affirm grace because that's, that's completely contradictory to grace. Romans 3 and verse 23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We understand that the wage of sin is death. That verse doesn't end there, Romans 6, 23. It tells us the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. There are two parts to that. But I'd like you to look also at uh, Ephesians chapter 3. And I might be begging your pardon just a second. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where Paul writes, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now there's a lot in that verse that we could cover that we won't have the opportunity to cover this morning. But I want to point out a few things is that it's not of yourselves. You know, the idea that there's a quality within somebody and God looks down and says, well, that person, he's so cute and sweet. I'm just going to have to save him. This tells us that grace is contrary to that idea. So when we start saying that somebody is saved on the basis of piety, well, then we're getting rid of grace. We've just shelled it. It's gone. There is no grace. Sometimes we talk about the idea of faith. It is true, and this passage will tell us that, uh, that faith is involved in salvation. It's not faith alone. It's not grace alone, because both of them are in this passage. We have grace and faith. We have both of them here in this passage. We also have not of works, the understanding the passage and in the context. It's, it's not talking about works of merit, works of our own device, works of the law of Moses. It's not talking about those works, but works ordained by God. Those are something which are necessary, and we'll illustrate that as we continue on in this lesson. But it's not by faith alone. It's not by grace alone. It's not by works alone, as some have affirmed. But nor is it by piety alone that a person can be saved. All of these things are necessary for salvation, every single one of them. And they're all good and they're all wholesome. Every single one of them is necessary. The person who says that the pious person who spurns God's command to be baptized is saved, that person doesn't recognize the value of all of those things put together. That's the problem that's going on there. We need to understand that when we're talking about grace, that in the Bible, as you go through and you look at the terms used for grace, you look at the, uh, the application of grace in the passages where it's mentioned, that grace always comes in the form of a plan. 
I believe that's important for people to understand when they're thinking about what grace is in the Bible. Look with me, if you will, at Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, and see right there, in conjunction with other passages, how it is that grace always comes in the form of a plan. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, Paul wrote, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Now notice there, grace and salvation are not identical. Grace brings salvation. But notice how. He's going to show us. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice a couple of things about this. First off, grace comes and it teaches us. It's teaching us the pattern. Is teaching us a pattern in order to procure salvation. He's giving us a plan. That plan, in this passage at least, contains two parts. First off, it contains works of morality. It's talking about things that, that we would term as part of the moral code. That's the way that we would define it. He talks us about denying godliness, worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteous. Don't act like the world acts. That's what he's talking about. Be above them. You know, those things that are virtuous among all people, do those things. That's the first thing about this. But the second thing is, you know, there's theology in this passage. There's theology in this passage. And if that grace is teaching you something different in terms of theology, then that grace is not the grace of God. Look at what he says here. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Isn't it important to understand eschatology? If you don't know what that means, that's okay. You won't... Uh, flunk out for that it just means study of the end times is it important because this verse is telling us that grace teaches us to understand these things and looking for it according to the proper understanding is part of salvation according to this passage the point that i'm making here is grace always comes in the form of a plan maybe that gets a little bit complicated looking at titus chapter 2 but i think it makes the point well but let me make it a little bit more simple a little bit more elementary Go back to the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 6. And you'll notice that in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8, the Bible tells us that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. You find out what happens next. God says, Noah, here's a blueprint. That's, that's a paraphrase, by the way. Here's a blueprint for an ark. Go build it. He says, here's a plan. Now, if Noah had found the grace in God's eyes, well, that's one thing. Noah's still not saved at that point because the flood's coming. If God extended that plan to Noah and Noah said, thank you, and rolled up that plan and said, I believe in the grace of God, he'd have drowned. Just quite that simple. He had to put that plan into action. He had to trust, believe, have faith in God. First off, that the flood was coming. Second off, he had to believe, have faith, trust in God, that God's plan for that ark was going to work to the saving of his house. And it did. And Noah did. And if Noah had chosen to deny that plan and not follow that plan which was given, which Noah didn't deserve that plan, by the way, if Noah had denied that, Noah would have been lost. There's no way around that. That's the application of the clear truth concerning grace in the Bible. That's how it is that we understand what it means when somebody looks at something and says, here's what God says, here's what God means, and I'm not going to follow it. It's a simple way to understand it. When we're talking about grace, we ought to understand that grace comes in the form of a plan. Now, the truth is that when people are talking about this, they see things, as I've already mentioned, one way, and they think, well, God's going to see it the way that I do because, well, because that's the way that I see it. That's way, basically what it comes down to. I'd like you to look with me at Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. And I'd like to look at a plain fact in this passage, but I'd also like to look at something else here that is often overlooked when we're talking about the nature of Revelation, but Isaiah chapter 55, we're going to start in verses 8 and 9, and I want you to notice there, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, if we can't devise in our own minds how God's going to work something or work something out or do something, then that makes perfect sense because God told us that's going to be the case, okay? 
And if we find that in the way that we thought something was going to happen is in conflict with the way that God said it was going to happen, then we need to be the ones to change on the basis of God's ways are better than ours. That's the simple point of this passage. But I want you to back up a few verses to verse 6. And I want you to think about when you've heard this passage quoted, a lot of people say God's ways are so high we can't understand them. That is completely the opposite of what this passage is saying. Look at what he says there in verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may not be found. That's not what it says. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. We can find God. We can know God. We can understand his will as he reveals it to us. And the rest of the passage goes on to explain that very point. Uh, as you look at the, uh, the idea given through the illustration in verse 10 and the application there in verse uh, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. His word is issued. It's issued for the purpose of being understood. Our God who created the tongue, who created language, is capable of communicating to us his will. We can understand it. We can understand it in such a way that we can apply it to our lives and then we can carry it out. That's what this passage is teaching us. Now, God's ways are higher than our ways, but sometimes people say, well, my neighbor is such a good person. God's not going to be let, let him be lost. Well, that's your thinking, but that's not what the gospel teaches the gospel teaches all of sin and come short of the glory of God. They need Jesus Christ. They need Jesus Christ in the way that God specified in his plan that was issued by grace. We didn't deserve that plan, but are we going to procure the benefits of it? Listen to what you find in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's what happens when man lets his thinking take over for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is death. Now back over to the parable of the sower. You can go and turn there if you want to look in the, the parallel passages. You've got Mark, uh, Mark 4, uh, Matthew 13, and uh, Luke 8. Did I get that right? Matthew 13? Okay. Um, and Luke 8, you can look at those passages and you can basically do an overview of the explanation of those, of those things in the parable of the sower. But I want us to understand just a couple things about it. First off, there are four types of soil in that parable. There are four. How many are there? There's two. Okay, Bruce is on to me now. You got ahead of me, Bruce. There are four types of soil with regards to reaction. There's only two types of soil with regards to salvation. Now, here's the thing, buddy. I can call this a sweet potato. Sorry about that. I can call it a banana. I can call it a chicken. I can call it whatever you want to call it. You know what it is? It's a microphone. You can look at a patch full of thorns and you can say that's good ground. And you can go and waste all your seed on that ground. And guess what? The thorns are going to choke it out. That's what's going to happen. You can go out uh, west of Katy and you can find two inches of dust. And uh, below that, the ground will be packed so hard uh, in a drought season. You can spread all your seed there and it's going to pop up real green after the first rain. And, and then after that, the sun's going to come out. And within a couple hours, it's going to wither away and it's going to be gone. You can call it good ground. You can waste your seed on it if you want to. The point about wasting the seed is not what the Lord's talking about here. The point is the quality of the soil. In this parable, there's only one soil that's going to bring forth fruit with patience. There's only one. And what happens so often is that people try to redefine the soils. They look at somebody and they say, well, that's good soil. I mean, he, sure, he's, he's caught up in the world. You hear people do this all the time, and the preachers here know what I'm talking about. They get a call, and it's some, some lady, and they say, he's a good kid. He's just caught up in a mess. You know, he's selling drugs, and, you know, he's been in prison six times last week, and... Uh, you know, but he's a good kid. He's a really good kid. Listen, we understand what the thorny ground does when it comes to agriculture. When we're talking about the heart, you can call it something else. You can make excuses for it. You can rationalize it. But it is what it is. We're talking about that good ground. There's only one patch of ground in the parable that's considered good ground. And it's that which brings forth fruit with patience. Now, I want you, to, want you to see the application of this. The seed is the word of God, Luke 8 and verse 11. Okay, the seed is the word of God. As you look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 19, you learn that the problem with the hard ground is that it did not understand. Okay, why is it that somebody is going to be pious in whatever way you take that to mean, okay? There are different 
different explanations of what a pious person is. Sometimes it's somebody who reads their Bible. Sometimes it's somebody who doesn't. Sometimes it's a person who only swears uh, on every day other than Sunday. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of different explanations of what a pious person is. But whatever you take it to mean as you're going through and looking at this, why is it that a person who is pious is not going to be baptized? That's the real question. If they're pious, how come they're not being baptized? That's the real question to ask. Now, sometimes the explanation is, if you go back and you read through uh, the periodicals over the last hundred years or so where this question comes up, a lot of times people make excuses, well, they didn't understand it the same way that I did. You mean they didn't understand it. That's what's being said there. You know what the description is in Matthew chapter 8? You know, uh, in, excuse me, in uh, Matthew 13, you know what the description is of the, the wayside soil is that which did not understand. Now what do we have? You're saying, here's a person, they're a good person because I see that they're a good person. They've heard the gospel and they chose not to follow it. They didn't have enough trust and faith in God to do what God said. But they're a good person. Why didn't they do what God said? Well, they didn't understand it. Well, the Bible says that that's not good ground. It's just as simple as that. How difficult does it have to be? You can call it good ground all day, but then where is your faith? When the Bible explains to us uh, what is the nature of these different kinds of soils, these different kind of hearts, you know, it basically gets down to this. Is there or is there not a test of faith in the Bible? You know, people don't like litmus tests, and I can sometimes understand why. But the Bible shows us that there are tests of faith. If you don't believe it, go over to Genesis chapter 22. God did tempt Abraham. Drop down a few verses, take thy son, thine only son Isaac, tells him to go offer him on that mountain. God tempted Abraham. And after he was done, after Abraham carried out what he was going to do, you know, Abraham didn't understand why God was doing that, but he had enough trust in God that he knew what he was doing. It's one thing to say, God, I don't understand how this works, but I trust you. I'm going to go ahead and do it anyways. Another one to say, well, you know what? Uh, I don't understand why baptism is important, so I'm just not going to do it. There's a completely different attitude, and that's the difference in good soil and bad soil is that difference in attitude. There is a litmus test when it comes to faith, there is a litmus test when it comes to the quality of the heart. And you find those all through the Bible. In fact, in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, James writes, My brethren, count all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, I know that that passage is not precisely talking about the kind of trial that Abraham went through, but it does show us that there are trials of faith. And as you go through and you look at the, the different soils, in particular the thorny ground and the stony ground, you find that their faith was being tried. And because of the quality of the ground, it didn't stand the test. That was what the difference was. It wasn't the problem with the seed. That wasn't the problem. The problem was with the quality of the ground. There are litmus tests when it comes to faith. Turn, uh, turn with me over to James chapter 2. And I want you to see this. This is so very important. James chapter 2. Look with me, if you will, at verse 10. James chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So you're a pious person, you're a morally good person, but here's baptism, and you say, I'm not going to do that. What's the difference in that which probably, and the person which probably most religious people despise, what's the difference in that and the person who says, you know, look at this next verse, do not commit adultery. What's the difference in the person who says, I was baptized, and then they're out there being a philander? You see, it works both ways. We don't get to pick which of God's laws are not important. You know, that was the real problem of the Pharisees. The problem of the Pharisees wasn't that they were binding what God said to do. That wasn't the problem. The problem was they chose to bind the ones that they liked to bind, and they excused themselves from the ones they didn't like to bind. That was the real problem of the Pharisees. If you don't believe me on that point, turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 23. And it's very, very powerfully pointed out there as Jesus Christ delivered a scathing rebuke to the Pharisees there. Notice what he says to the scribes and the Pharisees. Matthew 23 and verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. No name calling. For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Now, we'll point out there are weightier matters of the law, but look at what they are. Judgment. I know that you're not supposed to be judgmental today. That's politically incorrect, but that is, in fact, one of the weightier matters of the law. 
Mercy? Mercy is according to God's standards. Ephesians 4, chapter uh, 29 and following shows that. But also faith, and that's really what we're talking about now. We're talking about faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. He stands there in front of the Pharisees and he's, he's really uh, tearing them up. And he says, you're supposed to do, be tithing just like you are. But you shouldn't have left those other things undone. When I come across a person who's waving his flag, he's got his baptism certificate and he's duct taped it to his chest so that maybe everybody will pat him on the back. And, you know, saying, I've been baptized. And he's out there being a philander. I'm saying, yeah, that you ought to have done and not left the other undone. Or maybe in that case, um, I'll leave that alone. But then you take somebody who says, I'm a good person. I follow God's word, but I'm not going to be baptized. These you ought to have done and not to left the other undone. Wouldn't Jesus say that to those people right now if he were here? Why is it that they're not doing what God said to do? When it gets right down to it, the Bible leaves us with one conclusion. That soil is not bringing forth fruit. Therefore, it's not good soil. That's not comfortable. It's not easy to accept always. It's not easy to say all the time. But it's the only conclusion that the Bible offers us when somebody doesn't follow the word of God. It's the only conclusion. Now listen very carefully. It's a formula for success. If you've got good seed and the Bible is the word of God, it's the doctrine. And you plant that good seed in good ground, you're going to get good fruit. And when you take the doctrine concerning baptism and you put it in ground and that, that doctrine is not followed, no fruit comes forth, there's no baptism, the problem was not with the word of God. You know precisely where the problem was. The pious unimmersed, are they really pious? I like some of them. A lot of them have helped me along the way. They've helped me change my tires when I was broken on the side of the road. They helped me have opportunities in life. They've helped me in all kinds of ways. They've been my teachers. They've been policemen. They've been firefighters. They've been a lot of good people. They've just been that kind person who helped you uh, when you needed a pickup along the way. They've been those people. But people are not saved on the basis of their own personal goodness. They're saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1, 16 and 17. It is the only power of God unto salvation. And when Jesus Christ stood with his disciples back there in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, he said, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. If somebody doesn't trust God enough to do what he says to do in order to be saved, they will be damned. Now the gospel, when Jesus Christ sent them out to preach it, he told them about baptism. And we heard that sermon the other night and we, we see it in the example of the Ethiopian eunuch. By the way, a good pious man, you know, he was leaving service and still reading his Bible. He was leaving service and still reading. He's a pious man. Philip got in the chariot with him. He was invited, you know, because the eunuch was a generous man. He got in the chariot with him, and he preached to him Jesus. And we don't have anything else explained precisely about what it was that Philip was saying, but the Bible tells us he preached to him Jesus. Then the eunuch says, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Where did he get that idea? When you preach Jesus, when you preach the gospel, you're preaching baptism. And the reason for that is that our hope is based on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you don't want to identify with that, then there is no procurement of the salvation offered thereby, none. You contact the blood of Christ when you identify with him in death, and you don't have to stay that way just like he did. And it gives us hope of our final resurrection when we're raised to walk in newness of life. A new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You're not a new creature before that. There is no new birth without that baptism. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can read about it there in Romans chapter 6. When you have obeyed from the heart, that form of doctrine delivered you, then being set free from sin. It's only after that obedience to that doctrine concerning baptism and its identification with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, it's only after that that anyone, any person is set free from sin, not before. And let me point this out, that God is holy. 
And there's not going to be any sin from he in heaven. If you want to be in heaven with God Almighty, then the way to do that is by trusting God. Have a good and honest heart. Believe that what Jesus Christ said is true. Believe that it was true when he told them to go out and preach the gospel. Believe that it's true when we know that, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Believe that it was true when he said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13 and verse 3. Believe that it was true when he told them the necessity of making that good confession, that confession that Ethiopian eunuch made in Acts chapter 8, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And believe that it's true when he said that baptism is essential. There in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. There is no salvation apart from God's plan. His is the only one. It's the only power unto salvation. Today, if you're not a child of God, you take it seriously to be a moral person. You watch your tongue. You try not to lie. Take this seriously too. It's equally important. Perhaps I could say more important. Because without this, all the rest of it is in vain. He that rejected me and received not my word hath one that judged him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12 and verse 48. This is serious. Maybe you're a child of God. You've been baptized and your piety has slipped. I'm not going to offer you any more comfort than those who are outside of Christ. You're lost. You need to make a change in your life. If you need to confess your sins, you need prayers of the church, this is the time for that. If you need to obey the gospel, or have a need to confess your faults and need prayers, then come as together we stand and sing.